I think the the challenge is to create the best uh, tool on the workflow level, not on the model level. Uh, like you know, you, you see Pika, Runway, Luma, or whatever. They are competing with each other on the model level, mm-hmm. and we are not competing with them on the model level. Instead, we are competing on the workflow level. What I mean is that. We don't care about the model that we use under the hood. So we can, I don't know, if there is some better model than we use right now, all right, we don't care. We just, all right, just give it us API and that's it. Uh, what we are is, you know, a better way for creatives to actually work with AI models. Hello. Welcome to a new episode of Zero One Cast. Today we received the Dennis Shilov from Nim Video. Odair was not able to be with us today, but we have a super interesting conversation about machine learning, about some really profound and philosophical things like what is consciousness, what is AGI, what, how you define these kind of things, even touching some free will stuff. And we also talk a little bit about all his uh, initiatives. He's a guy who works in multiple companies, founded some, and really put some some products there out there to help people have a better understanding of what machine learning and AI is. And yeah, hope you all like it. Hello, everybody. We are here with Dennis Shilov, head production of NIM to more one episode of Zero One Cast, a place where humans dream and machines create. Uh, so first, we always like to thank you for having the time to be here with us. It's a great pleasure. I tested the platform and it was an amazing experience. So we'll talk about that in the, the podcast too. But first, I would like to ask you to provide a short intro about, about yourself. Talk a little bit about who you are. Yeah, sure. So I'm head of product at NIM. Uh, before that, I was working on neural interfaces for almost four years. Uh, then I also worked as software engineer at DeepNode, which is a YC company raised, I don't know, like $20 million Series A, I guess. It's like DeepNode is a data science notebook for you know teams and stuff. So it's mm-hmm. it's basically like a place to collaborate on your data science projects and play around okay. Python and stuff. At the same time, I co-founded several startups. One of them was called Fraser. Um, it's actually a, an app that helps you write better prompts for different uh, image generation models. Mm-hmm. Uh, we launched in July 2022. Immediately started to get some traction and stuff. Got first 100 users in just, I don't know, like 10 hours after the launch. Then we got into some, you know, pretty, pretty huge media, like AT level. I don't know if you know AT level. It's mm-hmm. like, a, yeah. Yeah, all right. Or so maybe. we got to AT level. Then we got to uh, the list of top 10 innovations of 2022 together with Dali 2 and Midjourney, actually, by Analytics, uh, Analytics India Mac. Uh, there actually is a like an article in Wikipedia about the startup, so it's like it's pretty huge. That's awesome. um, then I also co-founded Syntical. Syntical is a platform for AI researchers to you know to discover new articles and discuss them and read them in a more efficient way. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's currently used by about twenty thousand people per month, something like that. Nice. So it's also also pretty huge. So that's it. So I'm like a startup guy co-founding different, you know, startups and stuff. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's nice, man. That's nice. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about, about these this companies later. But first, I would like to, to ask you before your life and routine before AI, like how, how it was and how much AI entering in your, your career change your work life in, in general. I would say that AI is just a fancy name to say machine learning. So it was, you know, it was here with us for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just a new like reincarnation of the old term, basically. So uh, if we're talking specifically about AI and generative AI, I think like ChatGPT, it's just, it's like, wow, 
I use it almost every day. And so, mm -hmm. uh, j just to rewrite some stuff or I don't know, write code or whatever is just, it's awesome. Same goes for all the, you know, image generation networks and video generation, uh, networks and stuff. Um, that's it. That, that's changing the way people communicate, people envision th things, people create, that's it. So just a new way to basically, uh, tell others what you think. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, I don't know if you, if you agree with me, but I, I don't believe that any AI is really an AI in the sense of the sci-fi movie concept, which like self actualize and learn in real time and everything. Like it's, it always needs like the human input to like develop better models, create better workflows and everything. So I think it, it, AI is kind of a hype word, but, but I profoundly agree with you about the... the machine learning experience and it's been for a long time here. So yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. And, and talking about AI and creativity, do you think AI enhances or like replaces human creativity? What do you see as like pros and cons of AI in like a creative process? Oh, I think it's like, you know, so do, do you actually do you paint or I don't know, do you create some music or whatever? Uh, yeah, I, I play music and I, before AI was a 3D artist, so digitally, but doing, doing in a more manually way. Yeah. What I mean is that, you know, you, you don't think that like, I don't know, like a pen replaces your creativity, right? It's just a tool, uh, the exactly. same way AI is just a tool to express yourself. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not replacing anything. It just allows you to express yourself in different ways. Yeah. I'm 100% with you for sure. Uh, so let's start talking about your current project, Ning Video. Uh, how, how is the pro process of like getting to the company, putting it together? What challenges the team faced, like, and what we can kind of expect of the future of Ning? So Ning officially started early February, I guess, when my friend Yuri, uh, he is actually our CEO, he invited me to, to join the team. Uh, and so that's it. I think the, the challenge is to create the best, uh, tool on the workflow level, not on the model level, but like, you know, you, you see Pika, Runway, Luma or whatever, they are competing with each other on the model level mm -hmm. and we're not competing with them on the model level. Instead, we are competing on the workflow level. What I mean is that we don't care about the model that we use under the hood. So we can, I don't know, if there is some better model than we use right now, all right, we don't care. We just, all right, just give it us API and that's it. Uh, what we are is, you know, a better way for creatives to actually work with AI models. Mm -hmm. So we are like on top of the game of, you know, this low level uh, model competition. Uh, we are like, you know, workflow company, product company, not the low level model company. That's it. Yeah. And that's quite interesting. Like finding a niche where other people are not kind of overlooking right now, especially in the level of experience. I think Nin is quite differentiate itself from, from all the other, uh, companies. Uh, so I would like to talk a little bit about that. Like Nin was for me, one of the best user experiences in the AI platforms that I ever had. Uh, can you tell us a little bit why your focus so much on it and, and why the idea, what ideas you have like for making it even more col collaborative than it already is because it's a quite, quite awesome too. I would say that, so we, we see that all the players like Runway or Pika or Luma or whatever, they are competing on the model level and they invest like tens of millions of dollars into it. So it's like, you know, heavy R and D they are trying to train the models. Uh, so they, they like really trying to make it like awesome, but they are not really sure if, you know, they will succeed because it's always random with, with you train a model, you don't really know what, you know, what it will be able to do and what it will not be able to do. And so like you invest tens of millions of dollars upfront, 
uh, not knowing if the model will be able to do what you want it to do. And so, all right. So there is a bunch of companies like that trying to compete with each other on the model level. But we see another problem that actually it's hard to use this model. So even if we have like a really like perfect model for, I don't know, like AI video generation, then then what? So it's it's pretty mm -hmm. hard to work with that in the current user experience that these platforms provide. So instead of, you know, trying to build this model and then work on the, you know, user experience uh, side of things, instead we just, you know, we work on the user experience and we use the models as our, you know, under the hood and engine to actually empower the users to create videos and stuff. Uh, so it's just another way of, you know, looking at things. Mm -hmm. uh, we are kind of, we are not competing with all these companies. That's a good thing to do because they have tens of millions of dollars. Uh, but we just like, we help them basically ship their models to the end consumers by providing this end consumers, the tool to use. And this model companies like a way to basically distribute their models via our interface. That's it. Yeah. That's, that's pretty interesting because a lot of, of, of companies, they focus on this one button solution and you don't have much, you know, control. It's like, it's easy to use in, in commas <laughs> because it, it's super simple, but it, you don't have much control. And like by testing platform, you definitely give like a whole other level and experience to the users. And that's quite awesome because as you say, the model can be perfect, but if you can use it properly, like what, what's the point, right? Uh, yeah, that's what we actually observe. So for the professional users, only thing they need is actually, you know, control. Mm -hmm. So if your interface is too simple, it's good for occasional users and I don't know, some random guys that just looking around and trying new things. But if you're targeting like, you know, professional users, then your interface needs to be like, yeah, I don't know. You, you just need to have a much better user experience than a simple button. That's it. Yeah, I agree 100%. One other thing that really caught my attention on NIN was the partnership beta program that you guys developed with AI artists uh, in an approach which was quite interesting of aiming to existing brands that, that doesn't have much budget or doesn't have much still present on, on, on social media and start doing AI ads for this type of companies. So uh, how do you guys think of this idea? Why, why you take this route which is completely different from other platforms, which, hey, here's the shiny product that uh, we wanted to test it, and that's it. And what do you say was the feedback from the AI community of, of using the platform through the, the partnership pro program? So the idea is that uh, we have some existing markets right now, right? And, all right, we take AI video generation, and now we think, like, hey, we have some existing markets. How can we actually apply yeah, video generation for these markets. Mm -hmm. And so then we think like, okay, so what are the first markets to probably start adopting AI video generation? And so we have, we just have a list of ideas, like what markets can we try? Mm -hmm. And then there is a market called, you know, ads. And so probably, you know, these markets, like just video ads for brands or whatever, uh, these brands would like to try AI stuff, but they are too, you know, too scared or too lazy or whatever. And mm -hmm. so here we are, we just, you know, like we invest some money upfront, uh, paying this money to the uh, people involved in the program and creating the sets and that's it. So it's like a, like, uh, win-win scenario for all the participants and it kind of makes sense to you know try to launch this wheel of i don't know goodness in the world <laughs> that's it yeah yeah that's a lot of, of companies just trying to you know appropriate workflows and not giving credit and just make money over it and you guys involving brands involving artists and everything this is one of the things that most caught my attention in mean, like how different the approach was compared to, to other uh, platforms. And it was quite a, a nice experience. 
And I don't know if you can talk about this or not, but do you have any feedback from brands' side on this, these videos? Yeah, some brands actually published the ads, so yeah, the feedback is pretty positive. That's awesome. That's really great to know, man. See brands adopting things is, is quite, quite the next stage of, of AI in general. Uh, yeah. So apart from Nini, you mentioned that you, you work and founded other companies like Synthical, Fraser and Facer. Can, can you talk a little bit more about this, these companies? Like what they do, you already give a, a quite good intro, uh, but what is your role on them? Like what is the, the aim for these companies to, to the end user? Yeah, sure. So Facer, so I'm not actually, you know, working on that actively right now. It used to be a hardware company trying to produce neural interfaces for, you know, consumer markets. And it was pretty hard because it's a hardware company. And if you're building hardware, you need to, you know, to order some, I don't know, like PCBs and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know, some electronic components, assemble it, you know. And so the the development cycle is it's pretty, pretty long. So... Mm -hmm. You know, in, in software world, it can take you like, I don't know, an hour to ship new feature, but in hardware world, it takes you, I don't know, like several months. <laughs> and so it's, it's really hard and it's even harder given that, um, like there is no consensus on like how to actually apply this technology of neural interfaces uh, to, you know, like to have like venture scale outcomes. So if you want to raise for, I don't know, a company that tries to produce neural interfaces, you're like, all right, so what's, what's the killer feature that it needs to have to mm -hmm. basically, you know, to attract so many users, uh, to have venture scale outcomes of the hardware company. So it's pretty huge. Um, Definitely. and it's pretty hard. Uh, do you know what neural interface is? I have some idea I work in, in some, some projects that, that are involved with that, but we'd we'll love to have your take on it for sure in our listening. Yeah, so it's, it's like a hardware that tries to, you know, analyze brain signals and stuff. So mm -hmm. it, um, that's it. But basically you need to force a person to weird somewhere here. And that should be, a, you know, a really compelling use case yeah. <laughs> to, to actually to weird here the whole day. Uh, which makes it really hard to, you know, to, to find this use case and stuff. And it's also hard to, you know, experiment with new things and stuff because nobody actually wants to, you know, just, <laughs> uh, we are here just for funds. And so that's it. So it's pretty hard. And I've been working on that for almost four years with a team of 10 people. Uh, but then it's just, you know, uh, it was pretty hard to, to get funding for that. So that's it. Then, uh, actually I, uh, I was in, um, like a beta program of Delhi two. Mm -hmm. It was in February, 2022, I guess, or, or January. So I si signed up as, as an artist. So I got early access to that. And mm -hmm. so, uh, I got access and I immediately, you know, was confused, like how to write prompt. What, what is a prompt? And I was like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to write prompt. And so, um, at some points I saw a document on Twitter, uh, like, I don't know, 100 pages that tries to analyze like how to write good prompts. And it was like in, in May, 2022 or whatever. And I was mm -hmm. like, wow, nobody is going to read this document <laughs> yeah. uh, because it's like 100 pages. Oh my God. Uh, and so that's it. So it, it was an idea for the startup. Like try to develop an app that tries to optimize prompts for different uh, neural nets. Mm -hmm. And so I cooperated with my girlfriend. My girlfriend is a really good designer. She won Red Dot Award, if Design Award, all sorts of international design awards. And I'm a pretty good software engineer. So we just cooperated and we launched an app. Uh, and that's basically it. So it's a good story. Uh, that's it. That, that app is called Fraser. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's it. We, we were developing that. 
And then we also launched another app called Syntical once we noticed that, um, you know, all the current interfaces for scientists and researchers, they are kind of, you know, uh, they look like they are from 90s or whatever. Like the interfaces are pretty ugly. Like it seems like they just don't care about the, you know, user interfaces stuff mm -hmm. and that's it. But a lot of people, even in academia, they actually care. So, you know, you use Notion, you use, I don't know, uh, Google or whatever. You, you notice that, you know, the interfaces are pretty, pretty, pretty good. Yeah. But when you go to some, you know, research associated website, the interface is pretty ugly. And so, that's the opportunity, like to develop a better interface for all the, you know, scientific community to actually read papers, discuss papers, discover new papers, or do all that stuff. Um, another interesting detail is that a lot of, like, all the scientists in the world read papers. Mm -hmm. And so if we somehow speed up the, like, I don't know, make it more efficient to read papers in some way, yeah, then we help all the scientists in the world at the same time and kind of accelerate the human progress and stuff. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, and so the, like, if you do that, if you speed up the, I don't know, like the uh, way scientists work on 1%, then it's, it has a huge cumulative effect on the whole humanity. So it's like a really good thing to do. <laughs> Even if you don't earn money on that, it's just, you know, I don't know. I'm alive because of science, basically, right? Yeah. I, yeah, I visit doctors and stuff, so they are all kind of scientists. Um, that's it. So that app is called Syntical. It's an app that helps you discover articles and read them and all that stuff. One of the killer features is uh, dark mode, which mm -hmm. is kind of interesting because you have it in all the apps right now, but you don't have it for, you know, all these articles and PDF files that researchers typically read. And so if you have a dark mode for, I don't know, like you can have your paper in dark mode, you can actually read it at night without it burning your eyes, which kind of makes sense and attracts users and all that stuff. So it's pretty huge as well. If you think about it, it's a quite basic feature. Like you have to read a lot in this paper, so to have something that makes you read it better without hurting yourself, it's like almost an essential feature. So yeah, it's, but it, it's, it's kind of you know all the apps that exist right now they like it. So we are the only app that has it, which is kind of curious. Yeah, that's quite curious. Like how how much of the user experience is like neglected by by most of the brands. And it's nice to see that you're always focusing on that, like because it's it's what matters in the end is how the user will will have the experience itself. So it's quite quite interesting. And, and I see a lot of usage even in the AI world, like I, part of the Banozoko community, which is the people creating uh, Confuai I nodes and, and and developing new technologies for for kind of stable diffusion based things. They are have like just in Discord links to the papers and like it's exactly like you described like a crappy quality interface with like just a lot of words, some bad things. Yeah. For them, this will be like quite quite a good, useful product for sure. So it's like even in AI and outside of it, it's definitely a super useful thing to to do. Uh, exactly. Our target audience is actually AI yeah, researchers, so kind of yeah. makes sense. And I think it's it's completely necessary. And let's let's talk about a little bit the the more moral ethical part of of, of involving AI. In one term, like we know that it has all the training things that people talk lots about. I think everyone has his opinion, but uh, there's the other side, which is like the technology that evolves quite fast, and that is not the same level of preoccupation or the development in the moral side in like how things will be, how we will use all these things that are being developed in the future, what's the impact of it, like, or even like the, the thing that we just said a lot, like how we will make the best experience for users to, to, 
to have this technology. Like most people doesn't really care about it. So what's your take on that and how you see that it's important to, to level up these things or you think the AI will continue exploding in, in evolution and will get behind it in the mod, more ethical, moral side of it? So, I, right. That's a complicated question, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do you mean that, like, is it ethical to actually give access to powerful AI models just on, like, on the day of its appearance, or you need to wait some time to, to you know, to make people comfortable with using that? Or what? What's what's the like? Could you rephrase the question in some way? Yeah. So so. How do you see a future when we can kind of incentivate the moral ethical side of humanity to be more in pair with like the ethical use? Because in the end, as, as you, you framed in the beginning, AI is just a tool, you know, and, and yeah. we can use it to do marvelous, wonderful things or create fake news and, and really damage other people in the process. So, so do, you, do you see any type of... of solution or any idea to like try to reduce this harmful level of AI? So there is a bunch of startups that are trying to develop EA detection, mm -hmm. which is one direction of, you know, uh, trying to solve this problem. I don't think they will be uh, successful uh, because um, it's like, you know, it's like a competition of you know detection and trying to foolish the detection algorithm and it, it will always be like that so at some point there will be some i don't know like closed source model um that will be able to you know foolish this detecting algorithms and do all that stuff that they cannot detect and so you know it's not the the like the most optimal thing to do. What I think is that actually, you know, spreading fake news is, you know, it's it, it can be like on the governmental level disallowed to do. I mean, it's it's pretty simple to track a person trying to spread fake news if we're talking mm -hmm. about that, right? Mm -hmm. We have Twitter. We have uh, when, when you sign up on Twitter, you have your phone number linked to the Twitter account. So it's pretty simple to, you know, just take this phone number and understand what this person, uh, like, where is this person? Uh, mm -hmm. Who is he? So it's pretty simple to detect that just by phone number. Um, what else? So th there are, like, already two directions. Like, one is trying to detect EI stuff. The second one is just forcing everyone to not spread fake news. But... Like, what is fake news at the end? Like, maybe someone was trying to, I don't know, uh, spread some message, a message that they thought it's, it's, you know, it's not fake news. How do you, you know, state that in the law? Like, what is fake news? Nobody knows. Yeah. Um, all right, what else? Like, what do you think? What, what are the, the ways how to uh, combat this problem? Yeah, I think we start to need to get governments quite involved in, in, in media and this kind of stuff, not as a regulatory agent, but because that will, can be really dangerous really fast if you yeah. go to that route, but as a facilitator of, of the good parts of AI, let's call it, or, or this, this regulatory things that try to identify AI content, I mean, the content will be there anyways, you know, it can be a fake news or not, but if it's tagged that it's produced with AI or something like this, you at least know that it's your choice to believe it or not, let's call it, for example. I remember that at the beginning of last year, there was a Pentagon catching fire image that really quick spread oh, well. through like a lot I remember of, that. <laughs> of, of news and people, oh, AI can do this and I can do this. Actually, no, like we can do that with Photoshop for like 20 years, like you can do the exact same thing. The problem is that the journals and news things, they didn't check the information. They just spreading things without checking it. So like, 
having something that could help check facts, I think it will be interesting. But but also leads to, a, to your question like what is fake and what is not, how to really yeah. check if the thing is real or not. So it's, it's a quite a hard thing to <laughs> to think yeah, about. True. I think that's actually that's that's what Elon Musk was trying to solve with community nodes. I'm not sure if that's a successful, you know, initiative because we don't have community notes for every single post on Twitter. And so, you know, and another question is like, who is actually a person who is writing this note? Like if they are objective or not and kind of, I don't know. I'm not sure who wrote this community notes. I can be pretty sure if yeah. they don't spread fake news, uh, <laughs> is that... I don't know. Um, it's pretty hard to, you know, in our age of social media to try to, you know, trace the like origins of some stories and stuff. You don't really know what is right and what is wrong anymore since, you know, everything is on social media and you're like just an observer sitting in front of the laptop. So it's like, a, I don't know, in some way it's, it's um, you know, you should decide for yourself, I guess. Yeah. You cannot trust any content on social media. That's that's my perspective. Yeah, basically, basically, it's, and and like even history, like history books and everything, it's written by the people who won the battles and won the things. You know, they're not the full story of everything. So it, it can be quite quite daunting to, to just think about these things. Maybe maybe it's an AI idea to be developed, like develop one AI that is really focus on just check the most facts and, and, and see if maybe this work. AI will be biased. You never know. I mean, that's a model. Um, there is, uh, like, do you know Anthropic? Yeah. yeah. All right. So it's a um, pretty, pretty cool company and they publish a lot of research on trying to, you know, align models and understand what's going on under the hood. So they try to analyze the, so basically a model is just like, you know, it, it, on the low level, it's just, a, you know, a bunch of matrices multiplied together and mm -hmm. all that stuff. And they're trying to analyze what particular neurons in this model are responsible for. So in some sense, you can take the activation of this model and then try to figure out, all right, so there is a neuron activated in this model. Uh, probably that's a neuron that is responsible for fake news. That's all right. This model is trying to produce fake news then. So we don't really know what, you know, particular model is doing behind the scenes right now. Mm -hmm. Maybe in a year we will be able to do that. But even, you know, the creators of the models, be like, I'm not sure what this model is doing. And that's the core problem. So even if you have this model that, you know, is, you think is objective and, you know, tries to analyze if that's a, you know, fake thing or not, probably it's biased and you won't know. So. Yeah. In the end, this is based on the humans that program it and train it and everything else. Yeah. And it's uh, based on the data set and you cannot analyze the whole data set because it contains, I don't know, trillions of tokens and, you know, so you, you cannot clear the data set from biases and probably, I don't know, like maybe biases are the basis of our culture. <laughs> Who knows? I'm not sure. Like, yeah. yeah. It's a human thing. I mean, um, uh, like if you try to remove some bias from the model, then you're like, all right, so this person who is trying to remove the bias, is he biased or not? So it's like, it's another question. Like it's, it's a bunch of questions. Nobody actually able to answer right now. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a little bit of situation of who watched the watcher, right? Like, we yeah, so that, that's that's why I'm I'm thinking like, all right, so it's a responsibility of the viewer to actually decide what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, definitely with you on that. And last last question on this more polemical side, you you think 
the AGI will come to us and will be like revolution of the machine, slaving the things, or it will be something that will help us finally raise above our problems and, and create a better society? The problem is uh, we don't really know if we actually have consciousness. I'm not, I'm not sure if uh, you know humans have consciousness. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, do you think that we have um, like a true freedom of will or not? I think we have a limited free will. Yeah, for me, like maybe a limited one because you know the hormones levels and stuff. They actually affects the way we think and all that stuff. So you cannot really have a true free will, and. We only assume that another person, like, you know, we are sitting right now and talking, and I can only assume that you have consciousness in the same way as I have consciousness. Mm -hmm. And you also assume, like, all right, so this person has the same free will as I have. And we are trying to anthropomorphize the AGI, but we won't be actually able to, I don't know, like, to say, all right, that's an AGI here. All right. That's awesome. All right. Hello, AGI. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah. Um, and that, you know, it's it's hard. Like, how can you say that, um, like, um, I don't know, a creature, not of your species, that you typically assume to have the same consciousness as you? It actually has some degree of consciousness. I'm not sure. Like, what's your point? Uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I think it will be again, as you said, depending on how we use the whole thing but I, I do believe like we have consciousness I don't believe we have full free will I think it's, it's such a big word and such things such much things happening that you, you are restricted in lots of ways you know wanting or not wanting it but but I, I, I read a lot of things and study a lot of things about like how you can so for example there's people that kind of heal themselves using their, their mind. Uh, it's not like a magic thing, it's a whole long process, but like you can kind of create your reality in big commas here <laughs> by, by using your mind to influentiate things because in certain way, like how you think is how you act and how you act, it will generate results based on that. So it's, it's all like interlinked and a lot of people make it look like it's like some spiritual magical thing that i like okay uh, but in the physical level of it like everything is, is matter and energy at the same time right so <laughs> True. our thoughts yes. are, are that too so it, it's quite profound question to be honest but but i believe we can we can we have some kind of consciousness and things like that like i, I love the to read about people who have these near-death experiences and saw their own body and whatever is happening in the room and have other friends that have experiences that was like quite unexplainable in a, in a scientific level. So I believe there is something interesting there that we don't have yet the technology to study and understand it. But it doesn't mean that it's not there just because we don't know how to measure. Like even the human body in, in a medical level the amount we know about it is like ridiculous. It's so low and like it has so many problems that we need to fix. And it's just a matter of time in the end, like to learn about all these things and, and, and start True. understanding but what it. I'm, what I'm thinking is that, all right, so we have Turing test, right? Mm -hmm. And do you think that chat GPT actually passes the, the Turing test for you personally, I mean? No, for me, it's just really simulating things. It's not thinking of his own. True, all right, maybe. But what if you would be, I don't know, like, uh, there would be a time capsule and you would be in 1960s and you would be like, you know, talking to a machine and it would, you know, uh, uh, like it would say some things that only humans are capable of saying. And you're like, all right, maybe this machine is conscious. And that's yeah. the problem. Like every time there is a new invention going on, uh, somebody is like, "Ah, oh, no, that's all right. That's that's not. Yeah, that's it has no consciousness. Ah, stupid machine. All right, <laughs> let's move it further." And so each time, so there is a Turing test, right? The formulation is pretty simple. If you cannot distinguish between like an you know anonymous human and anonymous machine talking to you, then 
probably it is an you know a uh, conscious thing but uh you know right now we are like ah all right <laughs> that's all right yeah. so maybe it's already uh, like in some sense it is already like it can reason right yeah yeah i, I mean Definitely. you ask a question and it can reply to you in a good way and sometimes helpful way but what it is is actually just a mo- like a bunch of matrices multiplied together mm-hmm. so that raises the question like what is conscious and if it exists in the way that we think of that uh maybe in the end uh, you know this matrix multiplication is uh, also conscious Yes. Yeah, it's how how our brain really works in the <laughs> in the underneath. Uh, kinda, maybe I don't know. Like we we are not really you know sure how our brain works and at, at what point uh, you know the consciousness actually starts to appear. I mean, uh, let's go deep on the like, I I don't know like cell level, right? We have one single neuron. Do you think that this single neuron has consciousness? in a certain level like the f- limited free will i think it kind of kind of does yeah but um do you think that it's ethical to uh, i don't know like a kill a single neuron in a lab environment that's if it has okay. some consciousness is it ethical to do or not yeah that's that's an interesting question maybe uh but you know uh, each day we uh, grow some cells in lab uh, analyzing things. And so if this one single neuron has consciousness, then probably it's not a difficult thing to do. But I'm for that, actually. I'm for experimenting with neurons and, and stuff. So I'm like, yeah, right. so I the question is like, at what level, like, all right, so the one single neuron probably doesn't have the same consciousness as uh, I have, right? But what if we have a group of, I don't know, 10,000 neurons or I don't know, a million neurons, at, at what point there is consciousness? And mm-hmm. nobody can answer that. I actually recommend a book by uh, Robert Sapolsky. I don't, I'm not sure if you know who this I is. I heard the name, yeah. Yeah, all right. So it's a professor at Stanford. And he's actually, like, uh, the last book is called Determined. And uh, it's a book about um, the fact that he thinks there is no free will. And so that's, that's like the spirit of my conversation. I'm not sure if we have free will. Uh, and the same goes for, like, you know, maybe we already have AGI in some way. We just don't want to say that it's AGI. That's it. Yeah. And in, on the other side is like, depending on the type of questions you do to compare, like in the Turing test, I would say that lots of humans will fail and will not pass the Turing test. <laughs> so, like, what does it say about everything? <laughs> it is, Who it knows? Is, I mean... Yeah, yeah. I, I try to focus on great things and do good and help others and left for True. bigger minds to think these type of questions for now. The problem is that we can assume that you have the same kind of the same intentions as I have. But we cannot assume the same for this model because we don't know, um, like the training data that was used to, to train this model. We don't know the architecture of the model. We don't know all that stuff. And it actually, you know, all right. So this model was trained on some data. This data represents human culture with all these biases and stuff. Mm-hmm. So we cannot be really sure, like if you know, if it's good or not, uh, in your sense. Uh, so what I would, you know, I'm just for, um, open sourcing stuff and, um, talking about all that stuff publicly and openly. I think that scientific community would largely benefit if OpenAI would release much more reports and stuff, uh, about their models. Um, the same way as Anthropic does, for example. Anthropic mm-hmm. releases a lot of papers on, uh, you know, analyzing models and stuff. Yeah. Um, that's basically it. So I just, I'm not sure about whether or not, uh, you know, it's capable of things that we as humans are not capable of, for example. Maybe it can have some 
uh, capabilities that are somewhere, you know, deep inside hidden that mm -hmm. we are just, you know, not sure about. So we need to research that and yeah. we need to invest a lot of money in research and that's it. Yeah, 100% agree with you. And if you compare it between humans, like there's a lot of humans can do lots of things that I don't have any idea how to do. I'm not capable to do and I can do something and you and everyone has his stuff. So it's, it's a quite individualistic thing in the end, right? And it's hard to generalize a full technology based on that. It's, it's almost impossible. So I think it, yeah, you gave me a lot of food for thought, man. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks. On a more positive note now, what do you think will be the, the skills that will be more valued in the near future, like next five years for people that want to work both on the creative side and on the research side of AI? Wow, research side of AI is... Um, so the like barrier of entry is pretty huge. So you need to know all the technologies that are used to, you know, to create these models and stuff. And sometimes it's, it's really hard because you need to go deep and figure all the stuff out. Sometimes it's hard just because nobody really knows, like, you know, it's, it's the frontier of our technology. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's so novel and probably there are some ways to, you know, to improve efficiency or, I don't know, train models in a different way, better than the methods we have right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, for example, a month ago, or I don't know, like two months ago, there came out a paper on Khan. Uh, so do you know what uh, Perceptron is? No. All right. So it, it's basically, it's, um, so if you have a machine learning model, Typically, the low-level block is a perceptron. So it's basically a function that takes some inputs, uh, multiplies these inputs by weights, and then uh, sums that up and puts into activation function. Never mind. So it's it's like a basic block of building machine learning models. Okay. And it was developed in 1950s or 60s, whatever, by... Uh, some guy in United States and it remains like that for almost, uh, I don't know how many years, 80 wow. years, let's call it this way. Uh, maybe less, I don't know, May like maybe 60 years. All right. Let's put it this way. And so a month ago or two, there appeared a new article on like the new type of building block for, uh, machine learning models called Khan. And it's another like, way to train machine learning models, basically. Like, nice. uh, because instead of um, trying to optimize the uh, one thing that Perceptron tries to optimize for, you optimize another thing and uh, changes a lot of stuff and that's it. So you just need to read a lot of papers and uh, I don't know, do a lot of research, experiment with new things. All that I I think that the uh, like the one single skill that is absolutely required is you know just I don't know like uh, reading papers constantly <laughs> maybe that, <laughs> I can do curiosity, curiosity basically yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah basically curiosity um, that's it. Yeah, yeah, that's quite interesting. And I was facing something really similar, well, not similar, but like another case of it with like trying to work in AI with non-human models. There is no model trained on that. There is nothing that works like all the control nets, all the things that, that, that are being done are based on human anatomy. So if I have like a 3D character that's literally a star shape with crazy eyes and a mouth that is not human, it doesn't recognize, it doesn't work at all. And there is no one, in, 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 at least in the Western world that I know that is doing it. So it's, it's, it's quite crazy. <laughs> it has a whole area of things that it's just, it, it, nobody touched that, nobody developed anything that, so it's, it's not done. You, you can do it. It's a limitation of data set, I guess. So it's crazy, it's crazy. 
but it's, it's also interesting. Now it will require a curious mind that wants to do that <laughs> and start studying. That's another question, by the way. So, for example, if, we, if I take one image of, I don't know, like a dog or whatever, then a human mind can extrapolate things, right? So you mm -hmm. can say like, all right, so all this... Uh, other things that look like a dog, it's probably is a dog if it's barking and doing all that weird stuff that dogs do. But current machine learning models, they cannot do that, right? You cannot just show it one example and it won't extrapolate mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. that. Uh, so that's the question. Like, um, my, my question is like, at what point we can be certain that this is an AGI or it's like a dump matrix multiplication and we are just, you know, pulling around and uh, posing weird questions about <laughs> whether or not it's AGI or not. Uh, yeah. That's a question, like how to define AGI basically and at what points to think that, all right, this is an AGI. Yeah, yeah. Like, I I think move is defined as an AI that can operate by itself and do take decisions and operate. All right, uh, let's 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 create a mind experiment. So I take uh, I don't know ChatGPT. I take uh, like motors and uh, some batteries, and so then I just you know attach batteries and uh, you know this uh, accumulators and I don't know some notebook on top and uh, chat GPT and also this vision camera, right? Mm -hmm. And then I just launch it, press enter, and it goes somewhere. And so if I, um, you know, if I write a good system prompt, like, all right, so if you notice that the, your battery level is low, then go to the charging dock. If, you know, if you think you, I don't know, you're having problem with, you know, connecting to this charging dog, then call technical assistance and all that stuff. So if I describe it like in detail, like what to do in this particular situation and that, 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 and that, and I just launch it and go away. Uh, is it a life or not? I, I would say no, because the question is, if something happens completely outside of everything that you described, what you will do? That's a question. Um, I'm not sure, you know, humans will actually do something that is not prescribed by the society in most, some sense, right? Not. <laughs> or maybe they will. We are not sure. I mean, we, we don't have, uh, you know, research capacity to actually uh, research like all the reactions of people and if they are unusual or not or all that stuff. And the same goes for machine learning models. We don't know. Yeah. We just need to research that. Yeah, it's, it's as you say, just so so new. This, this all these things that we don't have enough data to to really understand them. That, that has been we, a we also don't have enough definitions. I mean, uh, we are not sure about consciousness, and so we are trying to figure out what AGI is. And by definition, AGI pr probably has some degree of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So we don't know what consciousness is. Uh, we are not sure if we ha we actually have uh, freedom of will, and we are trying to like, and we also don't know what freedom of will actually stands for. I mean, freedom of will in your perspective is what exactly? I think is to be able to do things. A little bit of the example as I told you, like be able to do things outside of the script, outside of the things that are defined. And, defined by what? And sometimes. In our case of humans, by society, and the, the, the machines will be like the set of rules that kind of is their society thing. I don't know. I don't know if they have. It doesn't have. Doesn't <laughs> exist, right? <And> so, <laughs> that's the question. I we we don't know, and we are trying to think about whether or not EGI actually is here with us in this room, and um, which kind of you know does make sense because we don't have definition for consciousness. We don't have like precise definition for freedom of will. And so we cannot really answer all these questions about ourselves, let alone this, you know, machine learning thing. Uh, that's it. So we just need to research ourselves and what starts with that. That's it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if we plug ChatGPT to this whole conversation we had, he certainly would be able to produce questions that both me and you didn't think of. 
and like yeah what does that say you know? <laughs> i'm not sure like uh, maybe this chat gpt is already easy or maybe not nobody knows nobody knows all right man we're getting to the end of the podcast we have just three more questions uh so do you have any favorite author artist person that really influences you and, and inspires you to do your work in the AI or outside of AI? <laughs> no, I'm not sure. All right. So I, I thought about uh, Schopenhauer. Did you read Schopenhauer? All right. Yeah. So that's, that's it. <laughs> it's, it's a good inspiration for sure. For sure. All right. Not sure if that's a good one, but because it, you know, it, it forces you to look at things in some different way, uh, but yeah, right. That that for me is interesting enough, you know, giving you a new perspective, forcing you to face things you're not usually thinking about. That that for me it works a lot by itself. So I definitely see the value there. I would actually recommend everyone to watch um, uh, MIT Open Courseware. As far as I remember, this channel was called this way. So there is a bunch of lectures about neuroscience and stuff, which mm -hmm. is pretty cool. And I would also recommend watching um, a series of lectures by Robert Sapolsky recorded, not sure, like maybe 15 years ago already. It's mm -hmm. on YouTube. You can watch it. And it's, it's so interesting. Jesus. Wow. We'll definitely get the links and put to the people in the, when the podcast sure. is released for sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot for this, this communications. So, uh, last thing, do you like to invite people to a platform, uh, any artists that would be interesting, our, our podcast niche is, well, AI artists in general, so, <laughs> so maybe they may be your, your audience, so wh why people should be interested in, in NIM? Because we have a lot of different machine learning models and we have the best workflow to work with them, that's it. And how to contact you guys? So we have a website, it's called alpha, no, it's, it's actually called nim.video, but you have, uh, you can apply for our alpha version. Uh, there is a form for that. So we just, we go over all this application and stuff and approve, uh, selected people to our, uh, alpha program. That's it. Sounds great. We'll definitely link the, the website on the description. And I've been part of the program, so I strongly recommend to anyone interested to have a, a great experience with, with AI to apply. And the last thing is, uh, we always like to end with a quote of, uh, about creativity. And this time I decided to go differently. And I'm glad that I did because about everything we talked today. So I asked ChatGPT instead of search a quote from a human, I asked ChatGPT to create 10 quotes, original 10 quotes that doesn't copy anyone. And I choose one here for, for like, give food for thought for, for people. And ChatGPT came up with creativity is the alchemy of the mind, transforming the ordinary into the extraordinary with just a spark of inspiration. Quite poetic. <laughs> Not bad. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't, didn't even ask him to be poetic, but it's, he did a good job for sure, for sure. So yeah, man, if you have any last words uh, to the audience or or anything you want to say, the, the hour is now. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Uh, if anyone wants to invite me to their podcast and also invite me, I will talk about philosophy and stuff. Um, that's it. I guess. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's great, man. Thanks a lot. I think we touched such interesting themes that we didn't touch in any other episode before. It was quite an interesting conversation and definitely made me think a lot of, of things and we'll, we'll be thinking for some, some days for now. Thank you a lot for having you here. Uh, to everybody, check in that video to check the awesome work that Dennis and the whole team is doing. And thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>